Today on Muscle Car, it's the return of the Oldsmobile. Tommy and Meg get to work putting baby tubs in the back of our 69 Olds Hearst Tribute Resto Mod. Plus, see a unique Mopar package and the driver that took it to the winner's circle. Then find out what's the best 20 bucks you might ever spend on your brakes. After a good bit of blood, sweat, and possibly a few tears, but I don't want to talk about those, old Project Business Time got to have her day on the road and at the track. But today, we're going to let our old Mopar hang out in the corner for a bit so that we can make some progress on one of our other builds, our 69 Oldsmobile. We picked this car up on a rainy day in Kentucky, and once we got it home, it was a matter of a quick teardown. It wasn't long before we had the body off the chassis and had it spend the day at the blaster. The concept of this car is a modern tribute to the classic Hearst Edition Oldsmobiles, and it's going to be a serious car, starting with a serious foundation, an Art Morrison chassis. With the body and powder coat primer, we popped out a set of wooden mock-up wheels and set the body down on our new chassis. A bit of tranny tunnel modification preceded the new floor pans. Finally, we took a trip to Greening Auto and watched them custom make a set of one-off wheels with a distinct Oldsmobile flavor. And speaking of those wheels, this is what they look like with a little bit of rubber on them that we got from Treadsource.com. The front ones are 19 by 9 and the rear ones a big 20 by 12. Now when running a wheel and tire combo of the size that we are, it's not uncommon to run into some clearance issues. That's the reason why we didn't go ahead and repair the rust in our inner tub. We wanted to have our wheel and tire in hand and give it a test run just to see exactly where we're at. Looks like we've got a clearance issue. The corner of the tire is actually hitting the wheel well and we're not even against the axle flange yet. We'll start out by marking the line on the inner wheel well that runs parallel to the chassis since we want to get as tight to the frame rail as possible. This will maximize the room for those big tires. The line at the top of the wheel well is where we're going to actually be gaining room. The new tubs we'll show you in a little while will remain stock size, but instead of welding them where the existing joint is, we're going to join them a couple of inches farther towards the frame rails, which will buy us more room. A body saw is good for making a lot of the cuts we have to do but in some spots there's more steel structure behind this wall, so we'll use a cutting wheel to let me make a shallow cut. Once that's lined out, I'll jump back to the body saw and continue on. You can locate the inner structures that I was talking about because you'll be able to see the spot welds on the metal. We got lucky right out of the box. The first saw was good enough to get the tire in, to get it to fit inside the chassis, but I'm worried a little bit about this edge for suspension travel, so just to be safe, we're gonna trim it back a little bit more and get what we need to make the new inner wheel well. And that should do us. Well, we've cut away the inner half of the wheel well just to get what we needed to clearance the big wheels and tires and get them inside the stock wheel well. So as soon as we get done with the other side and get it all cut away, we'll be able to put it on the ground and check out what the footprint of this thing looks like from the back. Next up, learn how to do rosette welds for a pro tub install, and then see how 20 bucks can do wonders to improve your stopping power. Mike's got our factory wheel tubs whittled out of our Oldsmobile, trying to make room for those big wheels and tires we're putting up underneath it. So with that said, it's time to start putting some metal back in it. There's a really good reason that Mank left a stock lip on the inside of the wheel well. It's going to work as our attachment point and widen out the tub all at the same time. Now you've got a couple of choices. Some guys opt to fabricate a set out of just plain old flat sheet metal. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that usually involves quite a bit of fab time. In our case, there's no real reason to reinvent the wheel if you know what I'm saying. 
Another route is to get a set of stock style pre-stamped tubs like these we got from year one. Now if you're doing a factory restoration and you got a bit of rust in your tubs, these work perfect for that. Or in our case, with a little bit of modification, these things can save us a boatload of time. What we'll do is use the factory seam we were talking about to anchor the new wheel wells up here. We'll use this seam which will give us another two inches or so of room which will be great for our suspension travel as well as the new wider wheels and tires. Here you go, got your new one. I guess I'll get started. What we're going to do next is we're going to remove the vertical seam here because we left the outer half of the wheel well in the car and we're going to shave it all the way around so that we can get an overlap between the new half and the old half. After the test fit, I found I was a bit conservative on my initial cut, which is fine because it's better to not cut enough than it is to cut too much. I just need to whittle away a bit more from behind the seat panel. It looks like that was all I had to be cut away for the moment. With the tub sitting where we want it, I'll plug the wheel back in and check to see how we're doing on clearance. That's actually pretty close for some minimal cutting. Uh, I think all we'll have to do is dollied a little bit in the back to get some clearance for the back corner of the tire, which we kind of expected. But other than that, um, it fits up in there pretty well. Well, we only have one small area that's gonna be a little bit of a problem where the tire is just touching the bottom of the new inner wheel well. So I'll disconnect the vice grips and push it back away from the tire and let it move and hopefully it will stay. And yes, it does. So I just have to move it rather than trim it and we should be good to go. You can see from where the original seam is and where the new one will be, just how much space we've gained. It may not seem like a lot, but when it comes to oversized wheels and tires under a car, you need every inch you can get. A few clicos and she'll sit tight while Tommy shows you how we'll weld them up. With the Clecos holding the tubs in place, it's time to burn them in. The way we plan on doing that is with some plug welds, and they're also known as rosette welds. Now this type of welding is used a lot by auto body rebuilders because it's very similar to the way the OEM manufacturers put the car together. When these cars are put together at the factory, the manufacturers have spot welders which use two electrodes to pinch together and heat two pieces that are fusing. In the repair industry, what's commonly done is to drill a hole in one of the two pieces and then use a MIG welder to place a weld that holds the two of them together. Let's take a look at how these welds should look when they're done. Tommy will place a cold weld, then one that's a bit too hot, and then one that's a lot too hot. And then one that's just right. Who is Tommy, Goldilocks? The first one you can see it was a little bit cold because it's actually balling up before it burns in. Now this one you can tell it's obviously way too hot because it actually burned through the bottom layer. Now at first glance these two both look really really nice, but one of them's telling the story. Now this one is what you're looking for. This one the heat was actually too high and was just about to become one just like that. Now it's simply a matter of taking that technique and applying it to the tubs themselves. Once the metal is moved into place, welded, and the joint seam sealed, we'll have the same type of weatherproof connection as the factory would have had. Still ahead, you know how some people talk about that car they never should have sold back in the day? Well, what if that car was worth a couple hundred thousand clams now? Today's flashback, a 1965 Dodge Coronet Superstock. That thing got a Hemi? Yes, it does. The year was 1965, and Chrysler offered its infamous engine to the public for the first time. To get one, though, you had to fork over an extra 1800 bucks and sign away your warranty. That's because this engine was in full race tune built to power Dodge's factory modified super stock Coronet, a car designed with one thing in mind, to win at the strip. Well, that's exactly what Harmon Friend was looking for back in 1965. 
He was one of the lucky few to get his hands on one. The surge of power in this thing feels like you're getting shot out of a cannon. He raced harm's way all over the Midwest, drawing a lot of attention with his roller skate wheelie bars. His goal was to break a record, and he promised his wife he'd sell the car as soon as he did. The Hemi found its way into the Coronet when NASCAR banned the engine after Dodge used it to completely annihilate the competition in the 1964 season. Chrysler packed up its things and poured all of its resources into drag racing. The Coronet was Dodge's new mid-size model and a perfect fit for a 426. Only 101 units were built to meet the NHRA quota. Dodge did everything they could to lighten up the car while sticking to the new Superstock rules. That meant no aluminum bodies or plexiglass windows. Dodge had a few tricks up its sleeve, though, to get around that, like acid dipping the fenders in hood and using thinner glass for the windows. Even the race Hemi got the weight loss treatment with cast aluminum cylinder heads and a magnesium intake. Then they went to work hitting the delete button. Inner headlights and right hand wiper, delete. Rear seat, delete. Radio and heater, delete. Visors, dome light, coat hook, delete. They even got rid of the parking gear. Yeah, and notice the funky shift pattern? Reverse, neutral, first, second drive. That's so you can manually upshift to drive without accidentally throwing it into reverse. Plus the tranny had a high stall torque converter to feed that RPM hungry Hemi. The setup was nicknamed Dial-A-Win because it was so dang dependable at the track. Dodge dominated the strip that year with Bob Harrop's Coronet winning the NHRA Nationals. Harm raced his car for four years until he set an AHRA class record of 119 miles an hour at Norwalk Dragway. He kept his word and sold the car, never thinking he'd see it again. But history had something else in store. Over a year ago, I got a phone call. He says, you don't know us. We know a little bit about you. We have your old race car. And I, I thought to myself, what? The car had been found in a barn and bought by Danny Proctor, who had it restored by the guys at Pro Classics. We started with a really big bucket of bolts and just really think we transformed it into something really nice after a year and a half of hard work. Matt made sure it was returned to exact OE specs before he showed it to harm. I had tears in my eyes. The first time I walked up to it, I, I, I had tears in my eyes. The car that cost him about 4,400 bucks brand new, yeah. Now that sucker's worth almost 200 grand. See, I tell you, she didn't sell this thing. <laughs> Looking for a good buy? Coming up, a $20 easy mod that's worth way more than its weight in gold. Hey guys, the last couple of cars we've worked on in the shop have been from towards the end of the muscle car era our Ozomobiles in 1969, and the Dart in 1974. It's been a while since we talked about anything from the front end of the muscle car era, which we're gonna to do today and touch that end of automotive history. What we've got today is another one of those tech tips that's not real glamorous, but definitely worth knowing if you have an older hot rod or muscle car that has a master cylinder mounted under the chassis. We're gonna talk about the residual pressure valves that you can put in line to give you a better brake pedal if your car spends some time sitting. A lot of the cars that came from the early muscle car era and the hot rod era had master cylinders that were located underneath the floorboard and chassis of the car. And for those of you that have chosen to leave them there instead of modifying them and taking them up to the firewall, you found that you can run into one major problem that happens quite a bit. With the reservoir and the master cylinder being located underneath the floor, the fluid level in that which supplies the wheel cylinders is at a lower elevation than the wheel cylinders themselves that actuate the brakes. What can happen is, if the car ends up sitting because you don't use it as a daily driver, gravity takes over and the fluid tries to get off the high end of the wheel cylinder and drain back into the master cylinder, leaving air pockets in the brake lines. That will give you a spongy pedal and sometimes even no pedal at all. Luckily, there's a piece of modern brake technology that we can use to remedy the problem without doing very much modification to the system at all. Basically all this is, is a directional valve with a spring in it that will hold 10 pounds of pressure for a drum brake system, and it's also available in a two pound version for disc brake systems. Basically all you need to do is this, intersect the brake line as close as possible to the master cylinder and insert the valve there. If your master cylinder has a single line coming out of it, you'll only need one line for the whole system, but if it has two separate reservoirs, you'll have to put a valve on each line. The reason we want to get the valve as close as possible to the master cylinder is we want absolutely every inch we can get of the brake line to be under pressure between the master cylinder and the wheel cylinder to eliminate 
any thread of bleed off whatsoever. The reason you don't want to put the valve, even though it may be easier, up here in this mounted location is because you will have pressure between the valve and the wheel cylinder, but it will still be loose on the back side, which is higher than the master cylinder, giving you the same problem behind the valve to the master cylinder. As for the residual pressure valves themselves, the reason for their recent popularity is a lot of guys are taking the rear axles, which are drum brake, and converting them over to disc in their muscle cars. It's a very worthwhile conversion to do because it gives you much better braking ability and shorter stopping distances. I can vouch for that myself because I've done probably a dozen conversions in the last year and everybody seems to be happy with them. If you made this conversion, you would stick one of these valves in the line going to the rear brakes to keep the pads tight against the rotors. Otherwise, the old style hardware up front, you'd lose this pressure and the pads would rattle on you going down the road. Well guys, like I promised, it wasn't very glamorous, but if you have one of these systems on an older muscle car or hot rod, it's well worth the investment. For about 20 bucks and a little time, you can get your brake system into top notch shape. If you have any questions about anything you saw us do on the show today, check it out over at PowerBlockTV.com. See ya.